Hello, my name is David Lee Dodd and welcome to this very special Muriel's Wedding Reunion. For the first time in history, we're going to be catching up with all your favourite actors from the movie, as well as a few special guests. Like everyone, I've been a fan of Muriel's Wedding for almost 30 years. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, whilst everyone was in lockdown, I thought it would be a great idea to get the cast back together and give something back to the fans, as well as shed a little light on the arts, which suffered so greatly. Today, we're going to hear behind the scenes stories, as well as see photos and footage that have never been seen before. So let's get started and let's go meet the cast. So I'm Sophie Lee and the character that I played all those years ago was Tanya Degano, who was the arch nemesis of Muriel. So I am Roz Hammond and I played Cheryl in Muriel's Wedding, one of the bitchy bridesmaids. My name's Nathan Kay. I played Peter Chook Vernell. Well, I'm Pippa Granderson. Hello. And I played Nicole in the movie, who was the one that got the black eye because she had sex with Chook on the washing machine at her best friend's wedding. <laughs> so nice. Such a nice girl. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jeannie Drynan. I play Betty Heslop. I'm Dean Kermond, and uh, I played uh, Malcolm Heslop um, all those many, many years ago. Hello, I'm Gabby Milgate, and I play Joan Heslop, sister of Muriel in Muriel's Wedding. Hello, I'm John Claire Lee. I play Charlie Chan. I'm Jenny Nevinson, and I play Deirdre Chambers. Hi, so I'm Rachel Griffiths, and I played Rhonda. I've forgotten her surname. Do you remember Evan her Stoll. surname? Eppenstall in <laughs> Muriel's Wedding. Uh, my name's Matt Day, and I played Bryce Nobes. My name is Kevin Copeland, and I played the character of the sailor. I actually called him Butch, but it wasn't in the film, so as far as the credits were concerned, so... Um, my name's Heather Mitchell, and I'm an Australian actress. And um, in Muriel's Wedding, I was very fortunate to play... Um, there were two wedding shop owners, and I was the, I think, the second one. I do feel a little bit of a fraud because the character I played didn't even have a name. I am the physiotherapist in the movie and I have one scene. My name's Di Smith and I'm an Australian actor. Okay, hello there. I'm Chris Hayward and I played Ken Blundell, the swimming coach in Muriel's Wedding. Hello, I'm Daniel LePayne and I play David Van Arkel in Muriel's Wedding. Um, I'm Annie Byron. And I played Rhonda's mum, Beris. I'm not sure my name was ever used, but I was Rhonda's mum. My name is Vincent Ball. I probably had one of the smallest parts in Muriel's wedding. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks. It's so good to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you too. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> oh, pleasure. And how did you get involved in the film? Well, uh, quite um, by, by accident, uh, luck, coincidence, fluke, destiny. <laughs> um, I was running theatre sports at Sydney Uni and a fax came through saying they were looking for people to audition for this, this role. And I was like, an audition for a movie? <laughs> <laughs> It was actually quite a long process. Uh, I'm not sure how it was for everyone else, but as I understood it, PJ had pretty much cast us all uh, as in the family, uh, at least I think three years before. But the film, it didn't get up initially. So it was up and then um, money was uh, uh, was lost and it went quiet again for a while. And then um, it got up again and, uh, and then they got me in again. From the second time, though, it was just a conversation, just to, I think, see that I, you know, I hadn't aged too much, so. I was at NIDA, which is the National Institute of Dramatic Art, and I said to my agent at the time, I don't want to leave and then do, you know, nothing. I'd done one other film and a couple of plays. What else is hanging around out there? And she said, well, there's this one film. I think you're really right for it. But, you know, it's a long ways off. It's not financed. A year and a half later, I just started kind of thinking, I wonder what she was talking about. 
I called her and it was so serendipitous. She said, this is bonkers. They've just called me. It's financed and um, you're going to go in and audition. I, I, I don't know. I just auditioned for it. I'm, my default position is like a skinny, sunburnt guy. So um, I kind of weirdly slobbed up and... Weirdly, he go. was the first person cast and I was waiting and waiting. It was torture. I finally got the call that I got. I screamed. I got the role. I screamed down the line and then I called him immediately. We screamed together. He banged it over to my house in Newtown. I got in the car and we went to Chinatown and pigged out. At the time, it was like the biggest audition going round. You know, the buzz was everywhere and everybody, you know, all the women kind of 25 and under pretty much who were actors uh, auditioned for it. So they looked at so many people and then we got flown up to Sydney for callbacks and they had groups of people that would be like this is for the bridesmaid roles of which there were four of us they kind of interchanged to try and get the the chemistry right I guess right dynamic yeah yeah I'd forgotten about that yeah they assembled they wanted to see the chemistry between different groups and it was a nail-biting finish yeah And it really was when we came in the configuration that ended up being the configuration, it just, you know, we improvised because they had us there all day doing improvs and scenes and stuff. And some other actresses coming out having gone really over the top. Somebody came out, somebody took in tomato sauce or something and (laughs) kind of improvised a scene where they stabbed Muriel and blood came spurting out. I was like, oh, my God, I haven't done that. Was I meant to do that? (laughs) So Pippa and I were with the same agent. And I remember a day of us just waiting by the phone because it was the results day. We were we were at our agent uh, Barbara Lean, who's unfortunately uh, left this uh, this world. And uh, but we were there with her in the upstairs of her agency, with a lovely balcony, and and the phone rang. And I think she knew. Uh, I think she'd orchestrated us to be there together. Oh. And she had a bottle of champagne coincidentally in the fridge oh. although Barbara usually, she usually had a bottle of champagne in the fridge just in case um, and oh. we screamed the agency down and had champagne it was really exciting and so that was a really happy happy memory yeah so I remember auditioning for it and thinking that you know doing the South African accent was sort of the biggest challenge what I didn't know that the biggest challenge was making myself look like I was an Olympic swimmer because I was basically a scrawny, pale <laughs> drama student who, oh. you know, smoked too <laughs> well, many I was going to c- ask you about that. I was like, how did you get into that? I mean, the first of all, the accent, you, you nailed it, really. I mean, did- well, I mean, that was sort of the one thing I felt I could I could do. Did you have a, a vocal coach with you? To, yeah, to- I did. She was South African, actually. Oh, she was South she African. Was, yeah, she was great. She worked at the Sydney Theatre Company, Victoria Miloescu, her name is. Um, and yeah, she was great. Did you have to do a lot of training? I had to do, yeah, I had to, yeah, it was ridiculous. I mean, I know every young male actor and, you know, is in the gym now and sort of it's all about, you know, mm. there's so much in film. But at that time it was really unusual for, I remember right. all my friends were like, come to the gym. <laughs> Why you, like everyone was, you know. I auditioned for the, uh, for the role of Muriel's brother, actually. Did you? Yeah, I auditioned for it's Perry. They loved it. They got me to come back, but then the, then the producers met producers met me and um, in the second or third there was four four rounds of auditions from memory. Although the last one wasn't an audition, it was just the director wanted to meet me. So, um, what was interesting more for me was that uh, I was actually in a play with Tony Collette at that time at the Sydney Theatre Company. We were doing a Louis Nara play called Summer of the Aliens. And uh, Tony had, I think, five or six costume changes uh, throughout the show. Uh, but at the same time, she was putting on weight for Muriel. And so by the end of the show, there was only one costume left that she'd fit into. Oh, wow. I love this question. That's the sort of question that stars get asked. And I have to tell you, David, that for 43 years I've been a jobbing actor. So the way I got involved with this is the way I get involved with everything, which is that I was lucky enough to get a screen test. And I remember absolutely nothing about the screen test, but I do remember the first time I met Rachel Griffiths, whose mother I was playing. And for some reason, 
someone had made a mistake and they'd called us for our first wardrobe fittings at the same time. Rachel and I met when we were both wearing our bra and panties and we stood in front of this big mirror and we looked at each other and ourselves. We thought this casting was so fantastic. While we both had quite big noses, we didn't look that alike in the face, but our bodies were so similar. <laughs> They are actually, yeah, there is the same sort of posture as well and things like that. Yes. Know. And it came about, for me anyway, because Tony Collette and I had fairly recently to the film being shot performed in the Stephen Sondheim musical, A Little Night Music. She played Petra, I played the Countess, and we were at the Sydney Opera House with the STC. And then, of course, she auditioned for Muriel and she got the role. She rang me up one day and said, I, I have to gain all this weight and then I have to take it off and it's a huge role and my family are, are a, a way away. Can I come and live with you? And I said, well, yes, of course. So we shared a house, myself and another actress and Tony, for the, that entire period and beyond. Wow. So wow. at one point I said, there's something I could do in it. <laughs> and uh, Tony Mahood, who was actually the first assistant and had been in my NIDA acting year, he rang up and said, oh, look, you, there's a little role of a physiotherapist for a day. I went, oh, yeah, that was fun. So that's kind of how that came about. Uh, at that time, I arrived in Australia from New York uh, just recently, and then my agent at that time says, oh, there's this, uh, role, you know, in this uh, movie. And at that time, I guess the biggest person in that movie is Bill Hunter, of course. Right. At that yeah. Time. Yeah. So I said, oh, that'd be wonderful. You know, so I auditioned. And um, why? I don't know. I got the role. Must look the part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I went through a pretty rigorous process. I think I ended up going in like five times until he finally gave me the part after I reenacted the... Uh, after I acted out the, the beanbag scene with Tony in a rehearsal room. How was that to shoot? It, w it was kind of, I remember PJ saying at the time that he wanted it to be the central kind of comic highlight of the film. For me, you know, it was a unique experience. I'd never worked on a film before. I'd, I'd done a lot of TV before then, but um, we took about two days, I think, to finish that whole sequence, the beanbag scene. Usually it should take a day, but we had to come back and reshoot a couple of things because the glass they were using was safety glass and didn't look like real glass when it broke. So we had to reshoot a little bit of that. Now, we've got someone else here who is at the uh, famous beanbag scene. That's actor Kevin Copeland. Thank you for joining us. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, that scene that day? I tell you what, it, it was <laughs> on the day, it felt like, and I wouldn't know this, but it felt like we were shooting a porn film. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it felt like. There weren't a lot of uh, crew. The wardrobe at the time, she's like, look, here's, here's a robe, you know, go get undressed and blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, yeah, cool. And I remember that it started getting me nervous. I was like, what have I done? Oh, my God, what have I done? I'm going to do full frontal? Really? And what if that whole thing about black men being well endowed, what if that's not true? Oh, my God. <laughs> and I'm representing the... I'm representing the African-American race. Oh, this is going to be so embarrassing. But as an actor, you just you just go with it. That's yeah. what I loved about the juxtap. It was, it was Shakespearean in many ways, Muriel's Wedding, for that reason. It was kind of the you had epic height. tragedy counterpointing the, the most funny scene in the film. Right. With the most tragic scene in the film right next to each other. Very cleverly. Um, and it worked so well, funnily enough. It's the, the way it was totally. that. It needed that. Yes. How are you? I'm good, darling. I'm good. Thank you for joining. Oh no, darling, it's wonderful because you know it was such a, it was such a phone call to get David Dodd in Rome, and I thought, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if you've uh, heard of Australian um, author Clementine Ford. 
she had recently done a podcast and like a review on Muriel's wedding. And I'll quote her because she says that uh, Jeannie Drynan, who plays Betty Heslop in Muriel's wedding, gives the greatest performance of all time for any movie ever. She has barely any lines, and but managed to convey the slow disappearance of self that comes uh, for so many women trapped by marriage and domestic servitude. Golly, that's a lot. That's a lot to take on board. Um, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> no, I've never met you, but thank you for that. Gosh. Yeah, I guess in relation to this, I was going to say, was it difficult to get into the character of Betty? No, it wasn't, actually. Um, I totally understood it when I read it. And if you get a good script and you kind of know it's there and you're not having to go to war to find other bits and pieces, I knew where I've... I knew her. I just knew her. And there are things that happen um, that help you. Um, the um, wardrobe department gave me pockets. I think I asked okay. pockets. And it was putting your hands in the apron and kind of... The body language always helps as an actress to know where you're going. And I found myself often just shrinking. Where did you get your inspiration to play Tanya? Was that from someone you knew or? In my year seven year, um, when I had to catch the bus from Dudley to Gateshead, there were a lot of really quite rough, intimidating girls on the bus. <laughs> and they they bullied me, you know, physically and, you know, catcalling from the back of the bus when I'd done nothing. So there was one girl in particular who was really like the ringleader and and very intimidating. And I had this sort of seething resent, not resentment, but almost hatred, you know, when you're so terrified of somebody and you've done absolutely nothing to deserve it. So she was the focus of a lot of angst and <laughs> I've never forgotten her and I kind of channeled. <laughs> I was like, I can do this easy. I just think that girl yeah. on the bus. That's why that film's so relatable. I mean, everyone can relate to that film. I think if you speak to anyone, they, and they were those girls that existed in, in the school. So, it's, so that's how everyone feels a little bit like Muriel to a certain degree. Yeah, so. we've all got a bit of Muriel inside yeah. us, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, that girl only knew. That is yeah, if she only knew. Where is she now? I went to a school that wasn't kind of, it had the bitchy girls, of course, because every school has the bitchy girls, but they weren't so, they weren't so full on as that. If you look, look at the film, I think Cheryl's character, the character of Cheryl is the one who's quite the nicest of all the girls. Yeah. I feel like and she you know feels what? a little bit sorry for Muriel. Today, this is just totally coincidentally, I was at my storage thing and I found my book, right, which has the original script in it, all the original script no way. and all the call sheets and just being a daggy actor, my, um, you know, all my like Cheryl's diary at the back and it's so divine. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing! Like, yeah, in it, it's um, she's known Muriel since Muriel was seven, and they had been friends when they were little, but then she got really cool. Oh yeah. my god, that's fantastic! Is that something you put together, like just? Yeah, yeah, but I, I literally have not looked at it in twenty five years, and I found it today. That's crazy. funnily enough, no, yeah, baby animals <laughs> <laughs> and Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, and Nirvana. Well, okay, here's a story for you, David. After the shoot, okay, so I was on a diet of having to eat 14 wheat bix for breakfast. Oh, my God, that's crazy. 14, I mean, it was insane. I remember had, having to buy a special bowl to eat 14 wheat bix Now, th this is the problem, but I was spending, like, hours in the gym every day and everything. The problem was as soon as we finished, I was so sick and tired of going to the gym that I stopped but I kept eating the same <laughs> diet. So I was eating about 7,000 calories a day, but doing no exercise. <laughs> so I very, I sort of very quickly Robert De Niro and like blew up like a. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was like, appearances for a while. And people would say, "God, what are you? What's going on?" I was like, oh, "It's for my next part." <laughs> you know, sort of. Welcome, ladies. How are you? Very good. We're here in quarantine. In Darwin, I believe, right? Yeah, we're in Darwin. And the reason I'm here with this random is that this is my friend Rita Arrigo, who I've known since school. And when I first read the script for Muriel's Wedding, I loved it so much, but the character was such a 
confident extrovert and very bubbly and very unjudgmental and um, was really happy to hang out with losers. And that reminded me <laughs> of my friend Rita Arrigo. So I did this thing that I've never done before in my whole life where I took a script to a random, you know, non-actor and I recorded every single line of hers. And um, over the years, I've had quite a few people ask me if Rhonda was Greek or Italian. <laughs> Because I would do this like quite like second generation Italian kind of inflections, which are not mine. Rita's like, you're not nothing. You're amazing. <laughs> Pretty much all my cracker lines, uh, the delivery is just come straight out of out of Rita. And she would have been much more likely back in the day to end up with two sailors in a uh, <laughs> that's in right. A <laughs> one black, one white, both hot. But I also thought that I also taught Rachel how to dance as well. <laughs> oh, of course. I thought that yeah. was Cha Cha. We had one of Australia's best choreographers, Cha Cha, who, who did the dance and um, we practiced it for like a month before we did it. And then we went to see Muriel's wedding, the, the musical. The Waterloo the dance, you mean? The Waterloo dance. But the biggest disappointment was that the choreographer, you know, felt so like he had to put the stamp on it that he changed the Waterloo oh. dance. So on opening night, I did the Waterloo dance with the other Rhonda, <laughs> the real, the new Rhonda, who new was Rhonda. Greek. They had cast her Greek. Um, <laughs> and we did it on the dance floor. It was a bit of a, a little bit broke the internet for about one second. <laughs> What would be your favourite line from the film? I I think it really is your terrible Muriel. I, it, there's something about it. I, the way Gabby developed that was just perfect. It was great because it was so comically diverse in whatever situation that she was able to use it. Now, you have one of the most iconic lines in Australian or world cinema history, which has been quoted by the likes of Madonna, Will Ferrell, James Corden. You're terrible, Muriel. It's going to happen. You're terrible, Muriel. You're terrible, Muriel. <laughs> terrible, Muriel. You're terrible, Muriel. I just love it. And of course, the Your Terrible Muriel quote has inspired countless pieces of artwork. The merchandise, got mugs, towels, tote bags, and then people have been tattooed with the quote as well. The t-shirts. It really is endless. <laughs> um, I love the video that you put together of all those special famous people saying you're terrible, Muriel. That just... It just made my, made my day and my week and made me bid up myself. Oh, Madonna. It, it, that's, I think that's when you realise the impact that that film has had worldwide. It's like you, it's, it's bigger than you probably imagine when you think that, you know, Madonna's at home watching that on a, on a DVD player. or <laughs> Near with the hands down her pants, yeah. <laughs> and is it true that that line nearly got cut? Editor Jill Bilcock had to talk PJ Hogan into keeping the line because he'd heard it so many times it wasn't funny anymore and I know how he feels. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my improvised line is, P.S., I'm a big, fat, slobby uh, whale. You're getting it wrong. It's P.S., I'm a fat, so whale. There you go. People are still quoting it. We went to the Guggenheim today and I posted some pictures on Instagram. People are like, is that Muriel's brother? Oh, my God. P.S., I'm a fat, so whale. Um, I, so I recall sitting there, and, and you can actually see I'm trying to hold it together. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to crack. Um, but Dan was like that. He was, you know. Did he add that, did he? I didn't realise that was that. Yeah, I added a line. Did you bring me any presents? And she runs back out the door, back to the taxi. So, yeah, PJ was all cool with that. That was really good. And he kept that in. I love that was, line, actually. Did you bring me any presents? Did you bring me any presents? That's all you think about when your siblings... <laughs> Come back from somewhere. What did you get from me? A, a favourite that that people do like to bellow at me sometimes in the street is, "I'm married. I'm beautiful." <laughs> <laughs> My favourite line got cut from the film. In the film, the first time I appear is at the wedding. But my best scene, David, I have to tell you, was cut. And oh, PJ Hogan was right. It needed to be cut because the story just needed to progress at that time. But in in the script, 
um, I came to visit my daughter in hospital when she's had the operation and things are looking really dire. And she and Mariel are having a conversation about how they're going to live together in Sydney, blah, blah, blah. And Beres is not at all happy with this. Beres has come with the strong expectation that Rhonda will be coming back to pauper spit with her. And she has many objections to this um, plan for these two young women to share a place in Sydney. She said, well, Mariel... What happens when it's three o'clock in the morning and Rhonda falls off the toilet? <laughs> but that line never made it into the film. Oh, that's a shame. That's such a shame. <laughs> that would been, it, a shame. it would have been one of those lines that people still say today, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a good line. Yeah, let's concrete Mullen Beach. <laughs> and, you know, often my friends and I, we still say, like, you're right about those cupboards. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to get the movie out. I have got it here. There was a couple of other lines she had that were quite good too. Uh, yeah, the other one was, um, what happiness does your father have if he doesn't have me? <laughs> party, party, party. <laughs> How great's that? The original script. Party, That's party, brilliant. party. You've actually got quite a few good one-liners in that film. The other one is... Um, Oh, you were so full of life. No, <laughs> I'm not dead, Cheryl. I did love my, I think the most poignant line for me was, Perry, wake up to yourself. <laughs> That's one of my favourites. Oh, well. that scene was just, I, uh, it was everything. Now everyone knows the most famous scene in the movie is stick your drink up your ass, Tanya. <laughs> How was it delivering this line? I think made doubly so by my fabulous choice of wardrobe, vintage, uh, vintage <laughs> men's swim trunks and uh, <laughs> my ultra tight striped top and my and Kurt Cobain sunglasses. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that was deeply satisfying. I, I look at it now, I'm going, I was so cute. I was killer. <laughs> my, like, funny teeth and my, like, skinny little hips. Yeah, the wardrobe, I love it. It's so 90s. Okay. So <laughs> and your Superman T-shirt. Oh, the Superman T-shirt. Oh, the Superman T-shirt. <laughs> I, I had that for, like, another 10 years. No, it could be in a museum now. It could be. I mean, it's iconic. It should have been. Oh, do you have any funny stories from behind the scenes? It's the classic story, isn't it? You know, you get the phone call. Hello, this is Australia calling. We're filming at the moment. We're in Sydney and we need you and you're on a plane. But, I mean, the thing that happened was, which is fortuitous, I was, you know, 15 hours in the back of the bus, the back of the plane, and my ankles were huge. I got off the plane and they sort of whisked me down here to the peninsula just here where I'm living at the moment. Wow. Took me into the supermarket and the makeup department came running and they said, oh, Jenny, quick, 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 we have to do something. Your feet have to be swollen. I said, I have been <laughs> in the back of the bus. <laughs> Each are like huge. I mean, I hadn't met PJ. I'd met him at the screen test, but I hadn't met Tony Collier. I hadn't met anybody. And there was I walking through the supermarket, stealing shoes and <laughs> This, this, and that's the first scene. That was the first scene that I did. Uh, wow. um, and the rest is history, really. Um, I remember the four girls got along really, really well. And, you know, Sophie Lee is hilarious. And um, so I remember it's just kind of quite a lot of hijinks. But I do remember a really long day in the bridesmaids' outfits in Sydney on a, like, a blistering Sydney day, you know, the – Mariel's wedding, so oh, yeah. the, you know, the beautiful peach dresses. But I remember that being the most interminable day. And for some reason, Sam Neill came on set. Sam Neill's then wife or partner, I think, was uh, the head makeup artist. Oh, wow. Um, but I just remember having this distinct memory of all of us trying to, you know, hold up our skirts to get air under them and looking over and seeing <laughs> Sam Neill wander onto set, which is pretty exciting. Talking of that uh, scene at the at the wedding, with that um, was that your idea to to come back look, and have yeah, her? Have... Look, it was. I tell you what happened. So I was there in pink and blue and primrose too with my present, and we were getting to the end of the last day, and um, PJ said to me, "Ooh." 
what are we going to do? And I said, if I stay right here at the back of the church, I mean, you're going to bring Tony up up the mm-hmm. aisle. He said, what will you do? I said, I'll, look, we haven't got time. Look, it, I'll do something. I'll, trust me. And then I went to Tony and I said, Tony, darling, I said, do not look at me. She said, of course I'm going to look at you. You're my mother. And I said, no, it would be very helpful if you don't. And then I could see her coming and I could see her coming. And then, of course, the glorious moment is she doesn't look at me. And yes. Absolutely broken. It's For me, it's the most heartbreaking scene well, it, in the whole film. Is, you know, it is. That is the moment. Poor Betty. Poor Betty. You've got the opening yeah. line of the whole movie. Did you tell me about that. Just, was that improvised as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he just said, uh, you know, say something for the, you know, to open up something, basically. It was it was left up to me. So what did, what did I say? Um, I'm already taken love. Yeah. And a bit of, with the, you know. <laughs> I'm already taken love. It's a brilliant line. That it's cheeky, Aussie, line. dry thing, you know. Because the only thing I can really remember is that we had a choreographer come in to, to um choreograph the dance sequence at the nightclub between me and Muriel, which seemed kind of weird. And then we tried it a few times. And then I said, you know what? I, I feel like I'm dancing too well. Can I just show you what I would do? <laughs> and he just was like, yeah, all right. So I did my Awkward version dance. of bad dancing. He said, I think we'll go with that one. <laughs> it looks good. It works well. I think we were just uh, really focused on getting that scene right because it was a very short scene, but involved a lot of cast members and extras. And uh, and then I think it was quite technically involved because I had to bring in the uh, the, the smoking the, uh, the smoking prawns, you know. And, and uh, so they, there was a lot of time spent on the technical aspects of that particular. That scene at the, in Hibiscus Island at the table flip. How was that to shoot the the flipping of the table? Look, it was great. I mean, I the the, the eyebrow was just a, a thing I decided to do. <laughs> we mapped out the camera positioning with, with tape on the floor, as I recall, you know, one tape mark there, one there, and then we had to hit that mark then and that mark then and roll over and then punch there and then roll back over there. And so we yeah. had the marks that we had to hit and we looked through those and we planned out what we were going to do roughly and PJ had a few uh, things he wanted as well. And um, and we did it. But I do remember at the end of that day, have like having muscles that I never knew I had aching, and you know that was a, a really exhausting and exhilarating day. Mm-hmm. Um, it was that was fantastic. I loved it. It's a, it's one of the only faults in the movie actually that after you flip the table, yeah, you can still see you sitting there after the table's been flipped. Really? Yeah. And even though you you two are fighting on the floor, you're all sitting back at the table. You don't really notice it because it's the back where you can see the flower. And have you seen that? Have you seen that video that went viral of those two young girls? No. And and they're at a party and it's been compared to that scene. And the the girl is at the party. She does that eyebrow raise, <laughs> which I can't do. And the and the birthday girl grabs her and pulls her over the table. They're about six years old. And then she pulls oh, her by I the have hair. Seen it. I have seen it because she's taking the attention away from her and then she turns around and you're like, fuck you. <laughs> I've had people ask me to do that. One particular person wanted me to do it and so I, I did it and they went, yeah, no, that's not it. <laughs> I was as nervous as hell going on set though, I have to say. I was 19. Even though I've been on sets before, I was playing the husband of Sophie Lee's character and Sophie Lee was massive in that time. And it was my first film. <laughs> it was pretty funny because they rented out this house in Sylvania Waters uh, from a Japanese family, but they were still living in it. Oh, were they? Whatever part of the house was being shot in the film, they had to be elsewhere, you know. So Pippa and I had to rehearse a scene, right? And we went into the actual laundry that it was shot in. It was the scene that everyone was, like, most keen to see. <laughs> like, Sophie and, um, and Tony, they were all like, they couldn't wait. So... All of the cast were right at the monitors. It's, it's a weird situation where you have to make out with someone and pretend to have sex. Anyway, so every time we went to kiss, we just start cracking up laughing. <laughs> Hang on a minute. That's all starting to come back to me now. <laughs> Maybe I thought it was 
part of the scene. Yeah. Well, in my recollection, I remember that um, that we that we were both nervous, but I'd done sex scenes before. I was often cast as a sexual predator. Unfortunately, I don't know how that happened. But, um, he had to put his hands up my skirt and pull down my undies and my pantyhose. Right. Although I had a, I had another pair of underpants underneath, a G-string, oh. a modesty G-string, so he didn't actually have to pull all of my undergarments off. <laughs> we we finally start kissing and we and we're kind of you know kissing. In verse, the grandmother, the Japanese grandmother, with a load of washing, oh. and drops it, going very sorry, very sorry, very sorry. <laughs> and I, no, we're just rehearsing. And then the crew just all, because they've sent her in, they all hear this rapture of laughter outside and we're like, oh, oh that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Classic. Getting back to that scene with the, um, in the taxi when Rhonda and Muriel drive off, do you think it's odd that they didn't pack, it, she didn't pack any bags? <laughs> oh, I didn't. You just have to allow for poetic license there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they needed to get going quickly. They needed yeah. to get back to Sydney ASAP. I mean, they didn't That's have okay. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you <laughs> forgive that completely. I, I must confess, I did notice it. I watched it again just recently too. <laughs> that, but no, you allow that. Mrs. Z would have packed her bag and sent it down later on, I'm sure. That's right. She would. And she had a couple of scenes that uh, I don't know if you've seen them on YouTube. There's the that yeah. didn't make the cuts of the. Yeah, I remember talking to PJ about that, and um, mm. he said it was just so sort of relentless, um, the sort of cruelty towards uh, Muriel that it just by that stage having all those extra scenes because my character is particularly mean to uh, me. Yes. I think there was a scene about a pizza or something. Yeah, about the pizza cooking. This isn't food. What are the vegetables? Um, well, there's mushrooms and capsicum. I don't eat junk. You didn't even ask if she could cook. Well, I can't cook. I can't type either. I remember he said in the telling of the story, it was just another sort of sort of pounding down of, of mural and it was just too much for the audience. I mean, that's what he told me. Maybe he just... No, I, I, I probably agree. I think it's she's <laughs> she's gone through enough, I guess. I heard a funny story that when you start when you started shooting murals, you were scared that they were worried that they were going to fire you from the from the movie. And yeah. Bill Hunter, the great Bill Hunter, had whispered something to you. Is that... Yeah, I sat down for lunch and he's like, how's it going, Rach? And I said, oh, it's okay. I'm a little bit worried. You know, and he goes, what are you about worried about? And I was like, oh, you know, he's like that they'll find out that you can't act. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and he goes, Rachel, I'll tell you a little secret. They never find out. <laughs> I, someone had said that when you did the wedding scene, when you guys were getting married, that you, they put like a, a tube of like something in your hair. Is that true? Yeah, because there was, I mean, this is how the sweat. Of, yeah, there was a line and there was a stage direction in the script, you know, a bead of sweat runs down his face. And um, yeah, they sort of rigged up this, they rigged up this pipe. And then I think the makeup artist had a sort of pump on the other end, to pump the sweat. <laughs> and me being a serious young actor was like, no, no, no I'll do it myself. But I, I couldn't, I couldn't produce the job as well. So Have, have you seen the musical? Yes, I have. I have. I thought I'm not going to go and see it because I thought it'd be too silly for words. And then I got an invitation to the premiere and I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'll go. And I thought it was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I loved it. I did see in Sydney they had like an actual Deidre Chambers who's been a beauty consultant for 54 years or something go up and meet with the Deidre Chambers. So maybe she was based on a real character in the end. I wonder. So now speaking of the musical, we are joined by no other than the amazing Natalie Abbott, who played Muriel Hessler in the musical version. Now, Natalie, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. What was it like playing the role of Muriel? Did you study the film? Did you look to look at characteristics or anything, or you just gave it your own? I did. I, I did watch the film. I also watched the making of the musical documentary quite a bit. But also I chatted a lot to PJ and to also Simon Phillips, who was the musical director. And 
I kind of I found the more I read the the content of the script for auditions or whatever, the more I kind of felt like I had in common with her sort of thing. I thought I should go and see it before it closed. And I'm glad I did. I found it pretty traumatic. It was a very strange experience, kind of like time folding in on itself to watch, you know, then the lights came down and suddenly there was this new group of young actors playing this story, which was so kind of monumental at the time for the rest of the, for the first ones who were there, you know? So it was a very strange experience to see it being played out again in front of you. Um, but yeah. I thought they did an amazing job with it. I thought I thought it was uh, really well, really uh, adapted really well to the stage. Did you like the ending with uh, Muriel with Bryce, and Gina? Running with off Bryce. with Bryce. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, I always thought that's the way the film should have ended, so, you know. <gasps> yes! <laughs> You've seen yes, it. I loved it. You I loved it. Absolutely loved it. First of all, just sitting in the auditorium and listening to the groups of women, like my age, but large groups of women women coming in and f- being so full of enthusiasm and excitement and nostalgia. The girl, Christine Whelan-Brown, who played Anya, was incredible. And going backstage afterwards. They would have been so excited. It was really with- exciting. And Christine Whelan-Brown was so complimentary to me, but I was like, what are you talking about? You're brilliant. So it was a huge love-in backstage. Oh, my God. I went to um, Melbourne opening night. It was – I cried from start to finish, and I could not have leapt my feet for the standing ovation quick enough. It was so great. So good, yeah. It it was very well adapted, no? I think they did a really good job of adapting it. Didn't they? With all the texting, like, as you would imagine, the girls just – I mean, the woman who plays you, she does, it's quoted word for word. We don't usually do this, but your mother has to see how beautiful you look in this dress. I thought they did it brilliantly. And the song. The songs were so catchy. Oh, the music was unbelievable. The The songs were incredible. Katie just did an amazing job. She's a genius songwriter. Um, and I think it really captured a lot of the exuberance of, you know, particularly like queer Sydney in the 90s and how lots of, you know, outsiders, uh, just people that didn't fit into their kind of binary small towns, you know, had come yeah. to Sydney and were creating families. You have not only played Nicole in the Muriel's Wedding, you've played Betty in the musical. We've got the... Oh. I have to say, was it the opening night in Melbourne where I met you back? At we the, met, uh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, and I absolutely loved it. I thought you were fantastic in this role. Was it challenging to play Betty every day? Uh, um, emotionally, it was um, quite challenging. Mm. Um, although I don't say that to be ungrateful or to complain in any way, shape or form, because I'm sure most actors love a challenge. I certainly do. But I, I went to some places with, with her that, that are very personal for me. I, I, often we do that as well. You know, we draw on your own life experience to create your characters. Mm. But as Betty is in such a dark place and, and uh, such a tenuous place, um, mm. I, I found her emotionally really, really challenging. And, of course, I don't didn't break down with her on stage. I didn't want to play her as a victim at all. Um, Once I would get off stage is when I would often have uh, a really big release. The first time I played her in, well, during rehearsals, yes, but when I really invested, when I got out on stage, I got back to the dressing room and I just fell apart. Like I couldn't stop sobbing. And I'm thinking, right, okay, like another year and a half of this? (laughs) Um... And a great honour, PJ trusted me with with that role. Uh, We worked very hard together before he gave it to me and I I, I really felt it was a great great honour to be able to to play her. I think you you brought some magic to it as well because having starred in the movie and then having transitioned, you know, 25 years later to do the musical. And, yeah, a lot of people were very excited that I had been in the movie and was now in the musical and... I was glad that they were, and I, I you know, I, I guess it, it wasn't lost on me that no. it was quite an extraordinary thing to be able to do all those years later. I was going to ask you, had you watched the film again prior to take any 
any inspiration from Jeannie Drynan for the role? No, I didn't because her characterisation of Betty has stayed with me and I think that's the same for so many people. Mm. She was just extraordinary and mm. the Betty Heslop she created on film is, is for me, is the pinnacle, but it, it hit so hard when I saw that. Oh, Pippa, I know you're in this Skype and I want to say one thing. Thank you for being such a good musical mum. Oh, Jeannie, hello. And thank you. What a beautiful thing to say. You know, I just such an honour to be able to play a part that you just completely nailed. And and I'm thrilled that you that you enjoyed the performance and and just feel like I'm in very esteemed company playing the same character as you, my love. Pip's mum to me, um, she's she's amazing um she's just incredible like she's just she's such an incredible human and such a beautiful loving soul like audiences who love the movie also love the musical because you know we wanted to really do it justice because it's a it's a great story muriel and Rhonda really are tony's and rachel's and for for rachel to kind of be like you did really well like you did really really good it was kind of like holy god thank you so much this is a part of like Australian pop culture this this movie and people are protective over the things that they love and you don't you don't want to disappoint them in any kind of way so yeah so I think you definitely feel a certain amount of pressure to to perform to the standard that is expected. Did you keep anything from the movie? Kept her T-shirts and then I gave them away, I think, in the 90s as for fundraisers for things and the lady kept it in a drawer and then she um, wanted to auction it off for fundraising for a very good cause. I think she got a $1,000 for it. I, I signed a bit of paper. I didn't sign the T-shirt, but I did put it on one more time. Uh, um, yeah. Still fit. Oh, well. I've still got the original script in my garage in a box. It's probably oh. worth a fortune now if you ever put it on I wonder here. if it is, though, because how would anyone know? Because you can just print them off now, but it's still got my That's name true. on it. Now, I've got a question here that uh, from a friend of mine. He said, do you know if she got to keep that banana out? Oh, my God, the bananas. <laughs> no. and, uh, I, didn't, I didn't ask to keep it, uh, but no, I, I didn't get I to keep it. Chance. As I recall, it was like banana bosoms, wasn't it? Like, I, just remember the, I remember the big headpiece. There's bananas coming out of your head. That's what I remember. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, that'll be on my tombstone, won't it? The banana girl. Um, I had um, where I lived in uh, Sydney that became very trendy to have a sticker on the back of your bumper bar. Narrabeen, somewhere on the Australian coast. Palm Beach, somewhere on the Australian coast. Anyway, the girl that made them printed me a few that just said pauper's spit somewhere in like, the Australian <laughs> coast. And then people would like look, look, see the sticker because at the car park, you know, up at Palm Beach, everyone would have one of these stickers and they'd laugh and then I'd get out of the car and then they'd just go. <laughs> <laughs> straight, straight out of pauper's spit. <laughs> There was the nightclub in Kinsella. So we shot that in Kinsella's up in um, on Oxford Street in Taylor Square in Sydney. Um, the video still was on Oxford Street as well. Hibiscus Island. Hibiscus yeah. Island. Now, not many people know that that was filmed on the Gold Coast at uh, SeaWorld. I seem to remember we spent a long time in the pool one day frolicking around with these hunky blokes throwing us off their shoulders. It, it obviously landed on the cutting room floor, but I remember that day very clearly. Um, and the dancing day. I remember having to do the, the hula dance. Ah, yes, times. we all dressed up. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a fun scene, actually. I did enjoy doing that little routine. I think that was to um, a Blondie song, The Tide is High, Tide as is I remember. High, yeah. And we shot an extra scene which didn't make it into the film, which was on Victoria Street in Darlinghurst, which was myself and, and Muriel walking along and just having a little walk and talk at night which was oh, kind of my. before we got back to the apartment. <laughs> and uh, how long did you guys shoot at the uh, the church in St Mark's in Darlinghurst for the wedding scene? How many days was that? I remember it being over a couple of days. And in fact, I don't know if I was actually in the original, in, in the screenplay. I don't know that I was actually there. 
I think that was a last minute decision to kind and of to, get, to add a bit more heartbreak into the poor Bryce's at the at the wedding. Yeah. I just remember working my ass off to get a close up. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled up on the day um, and uh, they gave me two pieces of paper with the words on for the wedding ceremony. Anyway, we did a run through and wondered why everybody was looking so miserable. I thought, oh, well, just just a run through, probably on the take. They'll brighten up. It'll be all right because uh, it's a joyous occasion. Anyway, I said to the producer, I said, why is everybody so unhappy? And they said, you don't know the story. And I said, no, no, you give me two pieces of paper. That's all I know. But anyway, we did the take and uh, it was cut. And that was it. I had a few words with Bill uh, Hunter and uh, I shot through. And uh, there we are. In and out in one day. Well, in and out in half a day, an hour. An hour. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We went to a wedding shop. I think it was in Chatswood or somewhere like that. And um, no, we shot it in a couple hours. I think I spent longer having my hair done in the makeup <laughs> van than on set. <laughs> what was the name of that? Where the, the nightclub scene was shot in that, the grotto in... <laughs> yeah, I, I've been to the, the, the grotto a couple of times in Sydney, which is um, Breakers. They yeah. it. It's closed down now, you know. Has it? Yeah, just last year it closed down, which is a real shame. The... Um... The Chinese restaurant scene was at Rabbitohs um, Rugby Club. And that's where I first met Bill Hunter. And I'm like, hello, Mr. Hunter. Call me Bill. Was that the um, first scene you shot? Was that the Chinese restaurant? Yep. Uh, what was it like working with Bill? Was it intimidating or? No, it was like, wow, I've worked really hard on this role. And he's just going, show me the script. Right. Muriel. <laughs> <laughs> This was uh, very much the case with Bill, is that often he didn't read the script. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people don't realise that the house was in Narrabeen. It was not up in Coolangatta. Yeah, movie magic, everybody. Um, And the house is still there. It's still exactly the same. I went back recently um, with with my real mum, Betty, um, Uh, from the movie. You went inside? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same kitchen. Was it the same owners that lived in the house when you went back? Yeah, well... They told us a story that they had just bought the house when the um, location scouts knocked on their door and said, we want to film here for three months. It was strange, really, because when you're in a location for such a long time, it becomes yours. Mm. And, you know, that house, I knew when we walked up the stairs and went to the kitchen, I thought, oh, my goodness, but because it belonged to a family and they were there on the day. And it was lovely just to meet them and say hello and stand in the garden and chat with Gabby about our time spent there, you know, Mm. stories, you know, she was laughing because that's the, you know, saying I'm your terrible Muriel and all those things that she did. Um, So, yeah, I have been through there a couple of times um, just to, you know, go up. That's where it is. That's what it was. (laughs) Uh, you've seen the artwork by Nordacious, the Australian artist. How does, mm. it, how does it feel to have your face on people's bedspreads and beach towels? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that anybody's interested in having Deirdre Chambers on their Duna cover, quite I've, honestly. I've got one here, actually. Just got the Oh, <laughs> wonderful. She actually gave me a photograph, uh, you know, print of that, um, which I've got downstairs, and I've got Bill as well. But, oh, lovely. Uh, It's so great. I love it. I only saw it because you sent it to me on the Yeah. So your face is on, it's on coffee mugs, it's on pillows. (laughs) Honestly, (laughs) believe it. They're they're absolutely brilliant. I I think you did such a great job with that exhibition. Yeah. I saw when he was doing them on Facebook and um, he said, what one should I do next? And I said, do, I'm a bride, I'm beautiful. I mean, it's it's really cool being having been part of of something that is treasured by Australians, and you know that that has struck a chord with so many people. I mean, now that it's become sort of moved into the pop culture genre, Muriel's wedding, mm-hmm. your face has been printed on T-shirts. There's I've got some stickers here which I 
had got from uh, someone in Sydney that I don't know if you've seen these. These <laughs> is it for sale now? You've got your face on. They're the, for sale. Oh yeah, my god. <laughs> is it, that they sell the whole the whole set? There's like Muriel and um yeah they've got the. They're so good, aren't they? Could you have imagined that the film would have gone on to be such the success that it has? No, it's amazing, isn't it? It's uh, like such a great thing to have been involved in. I'm so grateful for it. But the fact that it's so, I reckon it's because it's got that beautiful darkness to it, that it that it survived, you know, that it's not just frothy and because it aged really well. If anyone had told you that they knew this film about, you know, an overweight depressed girl who loves ABBA was going to be an international hit, they would have been lying. I didn't quite know how affecting the story was going to be. And I remember being in the church when they shot uh, Muriel's mother's funeral. I remember seeing on the monitor and there was a shot, there's that shot of Tony getting up and leaving and running out of the church. And the camera moves back with her. And I remember seeing that moment and I remember that moment I went, oh, there's something magical about this that you can yeah. never put your finger on. Well, you never know when you do a film what, what the outcome's going to be while you're doing it. But I, of all the films that I've done, you know, if people say to you, well, if they say to me, you know, uh, oh, so what films have you been in? And you go, and I'll, I'll say, oh, uh, The Tale of Ruby Rose, um, uh, One Night the Moon. Uh, they go, yeah. And then you say, Muriel's Wedding. Oh, Muriel's Wedding! And immediately, I think about every, everybody in Australia probably knows Muriel's Wedding. I do recall we went to Cannes film festival when Muriel screened for the very first time and it was the most extraordinary experience to be there to sit there with them and watch this film being received by people and everyone just rising to their feet wow yeah I hadn't seen the film and all of a sudden we're at, in, at Cannes the Cannes Film Festival and there were maybe a couple of thousand people and there was a huge um, standing ovation for an extremely long period of time. We, we all just stood on stage and it was just this it, it kind of, um, it, was too, it was too overwhelming to really tell what was going on, but it was huge and con um, exciting and scary. Extraordinary. And I think the year after that Khan festival I had uh, run away for 12 months with my with my now husband and we were backpacking around the world and of course everywhere we went around the world we saw posters for Muriel's wedding and I'm going wow what just kind of happened and that's like extraordinary and it's still playing so and, and translated in so many languages in every yes. country Brazil Germany I mean it's everywhere it's uh... I think I remember being in Italy in Rome and it was screening and I'm walking down the street and of course it was the 90s so the internet was only in its infancy so I had no way of knowing what was actually going on with that production and there we were in Rome and I'm going oh, that's a poster for murals <laughs> in London you went to the opening and was it you got to meet the Duchess of Kent was it or yeah that's right yeah the Princess Royal yes the Duchess of Kent and she was sitting beside me and she got up and she said oh I they told me it was very funny but I thought it was very sad <laughs> and of course it was it is a little sad you know I'm speaking of sad we uh, the, the role of Betty was played by Gina Drynan and uh, she had, a, did you know she'd actually applied to be Deidre? I didn't know. I didn't know that before you told me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I know we were speaking the other day and uh, we are talking about how we met 10 years ago on a flight back from London and I had a little picture of us oh, here. You a photograph, didn't you? Amazing. And you haven't changed at all. You look oh. exactly the same. Do you ever have people coming up to you and, and quoting like, the movie to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Yeah, it, it does happen. Yeah, you're a terrible, Muriel. <laughs> do, do people come up to you in the street and still quote that to you? Um, oh, no, they might kind of lean over and whisper it in a cheeky way, like, I know who you are. Or they'll be like, oh, I know you from somewhere. Where do I know you from? And on the odd occasion, I've gone, oh, have you seen Muriel's wedding? And they've gone, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Why are you asking me that? I just said I'd know you from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, and as well, it's got the, I brought it with me today. I've got the, the iconic Your Terrible Muriel tea towel. Oh, wow. Yeah. I want to get my hands on a Your Terrible Muriel street banner that was hanging in oh, Sydney when the that. musical was on. People do have a great fondness for Muriel's wedding. So if they put two and two together, they. Often. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been seen it's a so warm, fuzzy kind of exchange when they say, oh, Muriel's wedding. <gasps> you were the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> they do, to my absolute amazement, still come up to me and say, you're Deirdre Chambers with great <laughs> excitement. It does happen. And often it's very moving because someone will stop me. Um, and it, it's always a different scene that has touched them. Some of them love the tea bag scene, and some people love the, the wedding scene, but all of them have a reason, and it's kind of like their relationship with their mother or whatever mm. it is. And they just sort of just want to say hello and how fabulous. Yeah. Very good for me, you know. Of course. Hey, by the way, did you did you know that in America, they don't realise that, that my character's name's Chook. They think it's Chuck. Do that. So when I was living in LA, they're like, oh my God, you're Chuck. <laughs> Chuck. Because <laughs> Chuck's a the name there, not Chuck. Of course. <laughs> turkey. Anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, turkey. Yeah. Did you know that the movie is based on a true story? Actually, after you called me, I did some research and found that it was. And I was thinking about what happened to the real people. I mean, it was very much his family and his story. Well, I didn't want to tell it as, you know, PJ's story, uh, but I'm very close to my sister. And uh, she really did pinch money from uh, our, our dad. Oh, really? Because I got out, I went to the film school, but she was still there being called useless. And uh, so she robbed him and my sister vanished and no one knew where she disappeared to. And she called me up and I said, oh my God, you're alive. You know, um, uh, you, you've got to call mum and dad because you know, they, they, they think you've become a prostitute or a drug addict or something, you know. And she said, no, I'm, I'm too scared, dad, because my father actually you know, threatened to, to call the police. Bill Heslop is a portrait of my dad. You know, he was a bit of a drinker and when he got, when he, when he got some booze into him and he would bring the whole family out to uh, Chinese restaurants. We'd often go to Chinese restaurants because he was a local politician and he'd just start laying into us in public, usually with um, uh, people he wanted to impress. Well, it's, it's so good that, you know, an artist can translate, you know, his life experience, right, into something that, that is appreciated by audiences everywhere. I mean, it, it, you know, it transcends, like, not, it's not just an Australian film, but, you know, the qualities and the, the issues that it deals with, you know, are international. And that you can have such a personal story and find so much humour in it, I find extraordinary, because most people find their own stories, particularly if there's hardship in it or there's been conflict, mm. that it's a very serious um, sort of burden for them almost. And it was later that he said, you do realise that that was my mum. I'm sort of glad that he didn't tell me because... Uh I had to make Betty Betty and I just, if I'd known it was his mother, I mean, I might have asked a trillion questions and I might, yes, have, true. I might have panicked and thought, oh, I don't look like his mother or I don't sound like his mother. You know, who knows what would have happened. See, now I need to find out who I was in the family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly. Malcolm. If there was to be a sequel, of course I would take part. <laughs> Who's going to say no to that? Of course. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, of course I would, especially if everyone was on board. <laughs> yeah, that'd be hilarious. Are you kidding me? Of course. <laughs> yes. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why not? Oh, if there was a sequel, absolutely. Well, I'm not sure what I'd play, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sure, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Anything for a dollar, Mr. Heim. Of course, yes. And I think the restaurant would still be there, and I would still be there. And then we would just still be waiting for Bill Hunter to come. I, I do reckon Rhonda would have died at 40, though. <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> so I don't know if there'll be a sequel there. Though. By making a sequel, whether you sort of dilute 
the sort of magic of the original. I don't know. Does lightning strike twice? Well, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, the sequel would be them together miserable. (laughs) (laughs) I always think about that. I think, you know, that was one of the questions um, for Mike Nichols, who directed The Graduate. What happens after they run away together in in the bus? And he says they grow up and become their parents. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I can imagine, you know, that being the the middle the midlife crisis version of Muriel's wedding. Well, I'd be so old. I mean, who would I play? Do you think Deidre would they, still be with Bill? Uh, no, because Bill Deirdre, Deirdre didn't want to know Bill after that. Don't you remember? Um, oh, that's she right. Sort of, yeah, yeah, she sort of blew him out. That. But yeah, no, I'd totally be up for it. I'd love yeah. to. Be, like my character's all fat and I don't know. Oh my god, I would be sending emails and plenty to get a role in that for sure. A sequel? Yeah. Of course I would. What do you think Cheryl would be up to now? I think Cheryl would be. Um, I think she probably got married. I think she probably had kids. I think she probably stayed close to home. Yeah. She probably yeah. stayed in Pauper Spit. Yeah, I think she stayed in Pauper Spit. Yeah. She might, you know, be getting the odd little filler here and there, but, you know, <laughs> she's probably not happy about losing you. You know, I don't think any of them would be great at ageing. Tanya Dagano, where do you think she would be now? She'd be in a caravan park. <laughs> <laughs> She'd I'm be smoking sorry. all day long. She'd go and she'd go down the Ari. She'd be, you know, playing the the machines and. <laughs> if you would have taken Chuck back. She took him back. They broke up again. She took him back. I mean, it's just like a love story that will never end. <laughs> so I think anyone would would um, do anything to be in um, anything to do with Muriel's wedding. I mean, I think it's one of the most loved. I kind of did another. I did another film with PJ called Mental, which is kind yeah, of goes hand se- in hand with this film. Kind of the sister film to Muriel's in a, in many yeah. ways. How yeah. did you get involved in doing? Um, so PJ Hogan just reached out to me through my agent, and he was like, "Look, I'm trying to get everybody back in, you know, some way or other, and would you like to be, you know, have this tiny." Part. But I remember I was at the cinema watching that and I was like, oh, my God. It's, it just it was having you in that. It's such a nice little homage to Muriel's in many Yes, yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Well, you've also starred in the film Tiziana Buberini, the yeah. short film. A lot of people might not have seen this. This is And with your fellow mean girl, Sophie Lee, how did you get involved in doing that? Soph got me into it. I remember because Soph and I, you know, became friends after filming Muriel's. That's true, yeah. You know, Roz often got me involved in comedy skits that she was working on and I you know if anyone would say to me could could you suggest anyone for you know a a role then I would often suggest her and uh yeah it was those shoot down at the supermarket down in Mentone where I ended up living you know 15 years later and going to the supermarket one day and going hang on (laughs) in this place. <laughs> no, I love that film. It's almost like a little continuation of, it's almost like what Cheryl and Tanya would be up to in a sense. I know. It's yeah. lovely, isn't it? Yeah. There's a pattern. And it was pattern. Tanya Lacey, wasn't it? Tanya, Tanya Lacey, Lacey was fab in that. The, the, after Muriel's, there was going to be an advert for Glad. Oh, that's right. Correct. Yes, Deirdre, but it was Deirdre and Bill and the children. And... Um, yeah, it went out to research, and I think that people really didn't like Deirdre Jenkins. <laughs> and <laughs> on that basis, they didn't warm to the commercial. <laughs> oh, it's such a shame. It would have been brilliant. If you could, if you could do one of your lines for me from the movie. Oh, okay. Are you ready? You're terrible, Muriel. Well, there's that, that first one in the... Marubra RSL was sort of, I advise women on the right lipstick, base and eyeliner. Better finish your orgasm. But you, but you probably know all about that. Your wives are probably gaseous. Looks like I'm next. Do you find it difficult to lie? What are you doing? What a surprise. David, do you take Mariel to be your wife? Are you taking love? 
This is a great man. I'm married! I'm beautiful! Silk Chantel. Imported. We don't want you hanging around us anymore. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> I would rather swallow razor blades than drink with you. Oh, by the way, I'm not alone. I'm with Muriel. Ironically, this is the one. This is the one line that I've always felt I never quite nailed. But anyway, here we go. You ready? Oh. Mum burnt it because she was sick and tired and waiting for Perry to mow it. Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, mate. What kind of person marries someone they don't know? <laughs> you sound, it's a better South African accent now. I'm a parking inspector. <laughs> I don't know if I said that in how many years is it? 30 years? Say uh, terrible, Muriel. <laughs> have you watched it dubbed, have you? Yeah, there's a little clip on YouTube. Ich bin wunderschön. Yeah. <laughs> so good, so good. It was so good to see you again. It's been so many Bye. years. 20 years or something. Yes, that's right. Oh, God, I'm getting and old. Yes. Yes, you should call your mother more often. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, David. Thanks for keeping us culturally relevant. Oh, I think that's it. I think we've wrapped up the questions. Have you got anything else you want to add? Or... No, I'm just so glad amazing. to finally meet you. I think you're amazing for doing this. Sweet. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks. It's been great talking to you, and I, I'll, I'll keep in touch, and I'll talk to you soon. Oh, it's a pleasure, David. No worries, David. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank yeah. you so much. This has been great. Oh, thank you so much for joining. It's so nice to see you again. Anyway, uh, take care, David. If you come to Australia, yes. give us a ring, and if you come up here, come and stay. I, I just see, want yes. to say hi to all the other... Muriel's wedding ites that are on this call. It's so great to see you all. Yeah, you too. And hello, everyone. Guys, so great to see you. Miss you all. See you soon. Bye. I love you all. And gosh, I wish we could all get together. And I'll see you when I see you, whenever that is to be. So lots of love. Lots of love from Mama. <laughs> Can you see me? I can, darling. And I can see all the mirrors behind you, darling. <laughs> Are you in a mirror I'm, shop or is that your place? I'm in my lounge room. I said you live in a hall of mirrors. Are you in a room of mirrors there or what? Amazing. Can I have a look? What a room. I mean. Very posh house. Look at mine. <laughs> Every time I find a mirror, I just buy one. Oh. It's kind of nice. Oh, my gosh. They're beautiful. Wow, fab. Yeah, and good luck with your mirror shop.